Um, so we'll get started. So my name is, uh, for those of you who are familiar with me, my name is Glenn Corbett. Uh, I'm the president of the Patterson Museum Foundation, and we're the sponsors of this particular speaker series. So for those of you who've been on before, you know that we actually have two sets of speaker series. One is the one we have tonight in which we bring in authors and folks who are historians and other folks that come in to talk about things related to Patterson history. We also have uh, the story, another series called The Story Behind the Story, Conver Chats and Conversations with Passaic County and uh, Passaic County historian Ed Smike. And so some of you saw the dimension presentations he did uh, over the last few weeks and things. So we're running these for the most part uh, on average about one, uh, one of each of these a month. So keep an eye on our Facebook page because we're going to be having some coming up. So on February 15th, be the next speaker series, our own Heather uh, Garci will be talking about Minerva Miller and her presentation, Can't Discriminate Against Negroes, the Minerva Miller story, which uh, is an early 20th century story of a young uh, African-American woman in Patterson and her uh, advocacy, of course, for equal rights for, for all people. And then on January 27th, about a week and a half, uh, Ed uh, and I will, I'll be visiting with Ed in his conversation series. We talk about Timothy Crane, uh, which some of you know was the individual who built the very first bridge across the falls at, at the Passaic Falls and probably actually interacted to some extent, maybe met Sam Colt in the around 1835 or 36. I'm sure they must have crossed paths somewhere because Patterson wasn't that big. So anyway, so that's that. So uh, without further ado, let me introduce Jim Rassenberger, a very good friend um, who will present his lecture about his new book. Uh, this one right here, Cole Revolver, uh, the Sam Colt story. And he's going to talk to us about Sam's early years uh, and, and very exciting things that Jim found out about Sam Colt that really a lot of people, no one knew about until, until his book came out. So, and, and Jim, of course, is a, a, a well-known author. Uh, I'll give you a, a few more titles that he's, um, that he's uh, produced uh, with Scribner, brilliant, the brilliant disaster, JFK, Castro, and America's doomed invasion of uh, Cuba's Bay of Pigs, and also High Steel, the daring men who built the world's greatest skyline. So he's written for many other, um, he's written, of course, for Scribner, but he's also written for the New York Times and a variety of different kinds of, of media outlets and things over the years. So, uh, so without further ado, let me introduce uh, Jim, and uh, we'll hear a story about Sam Cole tonight. So Jim? It's your, it's your mic now. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Um, and um, thanks so much for having me. Uh, thanks to the Patterson Museum Foundation. Uh, and of course, to all of you who are joining me tonight. Uh, you know, learning about Patterson, one of the first things I did when I began this book was head out to Patterson because I knew I, I had to go there. I didn't know a whole lot about Patterson at the time. Uh, and it was one of the real pleasures of writing the book on code. I was just blown away uh, by the museum. And I don't just mean the fabulous coat collection, um, but pretty much everything in it. Uh, also, I have to say, Glenn, one of the really nice things that came out of Patterson was getting to know you. Um, we've, we've become friends. And um, I learned a lot from talking to Glenn about the Colt family, particularly about Roswell Colt, who I'll, I'll mention tonight. Um, I think Glenn knows more about Roswell Colt than anyone alive, and I'm really grateful to him for the, uh, for the thoughts and the wisdom um, on that and many other subjects. So thank you. Um, my plan tonight is to show you some slides and, uh, and talk for a while, uh, and then if we have some time, maybe answer any questions uh, that might come up. Um, so without further ado, let me fire up my PowerPoint and we'll get going. Um, I think this, just give me a second. Oh, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. So I do need to be permitted to screen share. I'll take care of that right now. Okay, thanks. I think you go into security for that. I just made you co-host, so that should solve the problem. Okay. All right. Okay. And we can see it, Jim. 
You can see it, but now what I want to do is I want to, um, let's see. I want to run it as a slideshow. You can see everything, right? Yeah, um, just, um, yeah, we'll just start, click on slideshow and then from the beginning and then we'll be yeah, good. Yeah, I don't go. see slideshow. It's up to, up right. to the top in the orange, uh, the red area. Go to the right. Yeah, I see that, but it's not, I need to hit, um, yeah, let me see that. I'm trying to X out of this thing that's covering it up right now. The Zoom um, bar is covering it up. Ah. Hold on one second. Well, I can't get You see out. the animations and slideshow right, right, right here. We go. Okay. Slideshow yeah. and then yeah. play from start. Okay. Now we have that out of the way. Okay. Everything look okay? We're good. That's good. All right. Great. Thank you. Um, so, um, if you've read anything about Sam Colt, this is probably an image you've seen. Uh, this is Colt in midlife after he's achieved fame and fortune uh, as the dignified captain of industry who manufactured one of the best selling products of the 19th century. But tonight I'm going to focus on this guy, young Sam Colt. Now, this is a young man who invented the revolver at the age of 16. Uh, and then began producing it in Patterson when he was just 21 years old. Even sticking to the first half of Colt's 47 years, I'm afraid I'm only gonna be able to scratch the surface uh, of a really truly remarkable American life. Um, but before I get into Colt's life, a few words about his famous invention. Um, as you may know, Colt's revolver was the first ever practical multi-shot firearm in history. Now, prior to Colt, guns had to be reloaded after every shot. Many guns were very powerful and accurate, uh, but it was a serious problem in some situations to have to reload a gun after only one shot. Even in the best of hands, this took about half a minute, and uh, a lot can happen in half a minute, particularly in the heat of battle. Many inventors had tried to find ways to solve the problem. One common solution had been to add barrels. One barrel, you add two barrels, four barrels, even six barrels splayed out like the web toes of a duck. In fact, these guns were known as duck foots. Uh, the problem with a duck foot, you can see, is pretty obvious. Uh, they were unwieldy. They were heavy, and of course, they were not very accurate. They just sort of sprayed fire in all directions. Others had come up with some version of the idea Colt ultimately landed on, which was to combine a single barrel and a revolving cylinder with numerous chambers that could be fired consecutively. But Colt was the first to come up with a solution that worked. His most important contribution was not the revolving cylinder, but rather the method to turn it and lock it in place so the gun could be safely and accurately fired. Now, this drawing uh, of a Colt Dragoon from the 1850s, this is later than the Patterson gun, but it gives you, I'm showing it because it gives you some idea of how Colt revolver worked. Uh, by cocking the, if you look at the, at the bottom there, and try, I don't know if you can read the, um, read those words. By cocking the gun, uh, the hammer, it's marked I in the diagram, you lifted a tiny paw or hand as Colt called it, marked H here. And this pushed up on a ratchet at the back of the cylinder, which turned the cylinder clockwise one sixth of a rotation. And at the same time, a little bolt D dropped into a small groove on the outside of the cylinder, locking it into alignment with the barrel. After firing, the shooter cocked the gun and the process repeated. Pretty simple compared to the kind of technology we live with today, but at the same time, at that time rather, it was revolutionary, both literally and figuratively. Okay, now let's begin at the beginning. This, uh, Sam Colt was born in 1814 in Hartford, Connecticut, in an affluent part of the city just west of downtown known as Lord's Hill. 
Um, it's sort of where Asylum Hill is now, if you know Hartford at all. Uh, and you're looking at an image not of Colt's childhood house, none are known to exist of that, um, but this is a house of Colt's closest neighbor, the poet and book writer, Lydia Sigourney. If you've never heard of Sigourney, don't worry about it. She was very famous at the time, but her name has since faded into oblivion. But her house, uh, it gives you some idea of the circumstances that uh, Colt was born into. And she was in a good position to watch the Colt family when Sam was a child. A lot of what we know about the family at the time comes from her pen. This is Sam's father, Christopher Colt, a gentleman of fine form and countenance, is how Sigourney described him. Christopher Colt began his career as a storekeeper on Main Street in Hartford, but by the time Sam was born in 1814, he'd expanded his business considerably, becoming something uh, more of a merchant uh, and a very wealthy merchant at that. He also married well. Sally Colt, Sam's mother, was the daughter of Major John Caldwell, a Revolutionary War hero, and himself a very wealthy merchant in Hartford. Uh, and together, Christopher and Sally Colt were, in Sigourney's estimation, our handsomest couple. And they had quite a family. They had eight children, including two pretty daughters and a brood of handsome and boisterous boys. The one who caught Sigourney's eye was little Sammy, a beautiful boy, she wrote of him, uniting sprightliness with a thoughtful temperament. Altogether, the portrait that Sigourney painted of the family in these early years was warm, happy, almost idyllic. But then quite abruptly, the Colts' fortunes took a turn. First, when Sam was still five, came the Panic of 1819, the country's first significant financial meltdown, which virtually wiped out Christopher's wealth. Two years later, Colt's mother, Sally, died of tuberculosis, and she was soon followed to the grave by one of Colt's older sisters, Margaret, also of tuberculosis, and then by the other sister, Sarah Ann, who died in March of 1829 after committing suicide by swallowing arsenic. So this is a childhood with quite a bit of trauma in it. Shortly after Sarah Ann's death, the family, what was left of it, moved to the small mill town of Ware, Massachusetts, where Coates' father had been offered a job as a mill agent or supervisor of a cotton mill. Uh, this image here I found in a, in a local library. It's still there. Um, um, I mean, the house isn't, but the image is. This is a house that the Colts lived in. It was known as Ware Cottage, uh, and it was perched up on a hill above the Ware River and above the cotton mill. Sam was not in Ware for very long, just over a year. But this was an important time for him. For one thing, uh, living next to a cotton mill exposed Sam to the state of art of industrial technology circa 1829. Textile mills were still a new phenomenon in New England in the 1820s, uh, but they were the laboratories where the machinery and the industrial methods that would transform America later in the 19th century were first developed. And it was also in where that Colt first began to experiment with gunpowder, including a rather infamous explosion that he set off in the mill pond on July 4th of 1829. Using an underwater explosive triggered by electricity, if you can believe it, Colt attempted to entertain his fellow villagers by blowing up a raft on the mill pond. Well, he missed the raft and ended up soaking the crowd that gathered to watch, but the fact that a 14 year old in 1829 was even attempting to do this tells us a great deal about Sam Cole. On one hand, he was inventive and extremely clever. And on the other hand, he liked to blow things up. At 15, Colt was sent to uh, a boys' school in Amherst, 
Massachusetts called Amherst Academy. Uh, the Academy is just down the hill from where Amherst College stands today and down the street, by the way, from where the family of Emily Dickinson lived at the time. Um, later, when this school started admitting women, Emily Dickinson went, went here, in fact. But the main thing to note about uh, Sam's time at Amherst Academy is that it was very brief. He got into trouble almost immediately. In the early dark hours of July 4th, 1830, Sam decided to celebrate Independence Day by stealing a cannon from a local resident in Amherst and rolling it with the help of a few friends up College Hill. And you remember the previous 4th of July, he tried uh, his underwater explosion. Now he had a different kind of explosion in mind. When he got to the top of the hill that night, Cope began to light off the cannon in a series of blasts that woke up the entire town of Amherst. Folks would be writing about this event for years to come. They thought they were under bombardment. Faculty from the college came running out of their homes in their nightshirts, and they demanded the cult stop, but he refused. One of the witnesses of uh, this event was Edward Dickinson, the father of Emily Dickinson, who uh, in, a, in a wonderful letter to Colt's first biographer, later recalled Colt as a young, wild fellow. As Dickinson recounted the event of this night, um, one of the Amherst professors named John Fisk ran up to Colt and ordered him to cease fire, to which Colt, quote, swung his match and cried out a gun for Professor Fisk and fired off another round. When Professor Fisk demanded that Colt give his name, Sam replied, quoting Dickinson again, his name was Colt and he could kick like hell. Well, needless to say, Colt got himself kicked right out of Amherst Academy. And a month later, uh, in August of 1830, now 16 years old, he ended up in Boston aboard a merchant ship called the Corvette, having signed on as a common sailor on a voyage from Boston to Calcutta. It's commonly said that Colt's father sent him on this voyage to punish him for his shenanigans in Amherst, but that's not true. In fact, Colt very much wanted to go to sea. This is the voyage, uh, the famous voyage on which Colt supposedly invented the revolver. I say supposedly because it's impossible to verify and the only source is Colt who can't really be trusted. In any case, other than the legendary Eureka moment on the ship, nothing had been known about the voyage before I undertook my research and I was determined to find out more. In newspaper notices like this one, I saw that several missionaries were aboard the Corvo with Colt. And I knew that missionaries often kept journals. And I suspected that some of these journals had ended up in archives. So I went hunting. Pretty soon I found the journal of William Hervey. He's now he's identified in this article as Harvey, uh, but the name was Hervey with an E. Uh, and the journal, his journal had been published in a religious periodical. Uh, it was an extraordinary find because Hervey not only supplied many of the general details of the voyage to Calcutta, but he took time to write about one particular young sailor on board the Corvo who really tore at his heartstrings. This kid had made the terrible mistake of volunteering for the voyage only to regret his decision the moment the ship set sail. And that kid was none other than Sam Cole. Quote, but the poor fellow now bitterly repents his folly, Hervey wrote of Sam. He is kicked about without mercy by the mates and sailors. He says that if he ever reaches America, he shall never be caught at sea again. His first voyage shall be his last. According to Hervey, Colt was seasick, he was homesick, and he was in constant danger, not only physical danger, but moral danger. For a ship, wrote Hervey, was, quote, almost a perfect school of vice. Well, on the subject of vice, Hervey 
later wrote in his journal about a theft that occurred on the ship. One of the sailors had stolen a large quantity of raisins and sugar from the missionaries. When the thief was discovered, he was tied up to the rigging and flogged two dozen lashes with a rawhide. Flogging was a very intense event on a ship. It was excruciating, obviously, to the one who received it, and it was disturbing to most of those who watched it. You can see it in this image of a flogging from around that time, how other sailors turned away almost wincing. Now, the practice was so brutal, in fact, that the United States Navy banned flogging in 1850. Now, Hervey's journal did not give the name of the sailor who had been flogged, but I had a hunch. And with this hunch, I went in search of the journal of another missionary aboard the Corvo, William Ramsey. Lo and behold, I found Ramsey's journal in the archives of the Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia. I paged right through until I found what I was looking for. The date was October 20th, 1830, and right there at the top of the page are the words, quote, whipped. And you can see the entry beginning at the bottom of the page uh, where Ramsey writes, poor fellow, from my heart I pitied him. He now finds that sin is a bitter thing. I now knew two things about Cook. First of all, I knew that he was a thief, which is interesting to know. Secondly, I knew that he'd been subject to a brutal punishment. Other sailors wrote about floggings as experiences that tended to crush those who got them, not just the pain of it, but the whole experience, uh, especially the, the humiliation of being publicly flogged. What's interesting about Colt is that he seems not to have been crushed. On the contrary, the experience seemed to inspire him. It was shortly after this that he apparently, supposedly, invented his gun. Given the flogging, I think we can understand why he might have weapons on his mind. Uh, now, the story as usually told is that young Sam was inspired by the windlass on the Corvo, a sort of winch that sailors turned to raise anchor and haul ropes. And from it, he got the idea of a cylinder that could turn and lock. As the story goes, he cut his original model out of the pieces of scrap wood on the ship using a $1 jackknife. Um, the, now, these pieces are preserved to this day in a glass case in the Wadsworth Athenaeum in Hartford, should you ever happen to be there, which is pretty cool, even if the story itself is a little suspect. In any case, shortly after returning from Calcutta, Coat took these wooden pieces, or some wooden pieces, to a gunsmith named Anson Chase, who lived in his hometown of Hartford. And together, the two of them, Colt and Chase, handcrafted the first workable iron prototype of what Colt had in mind. But Colt knew that if he wanted to pursue this, if he wished to get a patent and to manufacture the gun as a commercial enterprise, he needed to perfect his invention. And for that, he needed money, a lot of money. This is when Colt, at the age of 17, launched off on the great American adventure that I call the nitrous oxide tour. Billing himself as Dr. Coult, putting in the extra U to give himself a bit of continental flair, he began traveling the country selling hits of nitrous oxide, exhilarating gas, as they called it then, or laughing gas, as we commonly call it now. Starting in New England in the spring of 1832, he moved from town to town, running out performance halls and inviting audiences to come up and try the nitrous oxide for the price of 25 cents or 50 cents, I think in this, it's 50 cents here in uh, Portland, Maine. And from these sums, he then financed the development of his invention. After appearing in Boston in June of 1832, Colt traveled to New York City in early July. What's interesting about this is as he entered New York, at the very moment everyone else was fleeing the city. A pandemic, the first ever cholera pandemic, had just arrived in New York, and anyone who could afford to was trying desperately to escape as fast as possible, heading north into Westchester 
or west into New Jersey. Not Cole. He comes sauntering into the city and rents the second floor of this building, the Masonic Temple on Lower Broadway. And on July 7th, he performs before an audience of New Yorkers who had not been able to flee and are probably in desperate need of a cheap laugh. From New York, Colt went to Newark, New Jersey, then he went back to New England, and then up into Canada, even up to Nova Scotia. And eventually he ended up in Norfolk, Virginia. I had a great deal of fun tracing the journey, mainly from breadcrumbs that he left behind, notes, receipts, newspaper ads, notices that I managed to track down. And this is one of the really interesting breadcrumbs that I discovered. This is the first page from a journal that Cope began in late February of 1833, when he was 18. I found this in the Beinecke Library at Yale. You can see that he's still writing his name with a unit. Journal of a voyage from Norfolk to New Orleans via Alexandra in February of 1833. It took me a while to figure this out because what follows these pages is nothing, just the stubs of eight or nine pages that had been ripped out. But there's plenty that we can figure out just from what we have here, starting with the ship on which Colt sailed. Uh, Colt was a notoriously terrible speller, and he writes the name of the vessel here as A, as Errol, A E R A L. But the correct spelling I discovered was Ariel, A-R-I-E-L. And the Ariel, it turned out, was a ship owned by the firm of Franklin and Armfield of Alexandria, Virginia. Now those names don't mean much today, but they meant a great deal at the time. Franklin and Armfield was the largest slave trading operation in the country. Colt was on a slave ship and not just any slave ship, but one that was transporting mostly very young slaves from Virginia to far worse circumstances on plantations in the Deep South. It would be fascinating to know what he made of his experience aboard this ship, but alas, as I say, the pages are gone. Well, from the journal and the number of other clues, I was ultimately able to map the journey that Colt took around the Western United States. And when I say Western, I mean the West as it was understood at the time when the country effectively ended just across the Mississippi River. So he arrived in New Orleans in late March of 1833. Then by steamship, he went up the Mississippi, then up the Ohio River to Cincinnati, where he gave a number of nitrous oxide performances in July of 1833. And then on to Pittsburgh that August, where, as I learned from a brief newspaper item, he was thrown out of town. Apparently, he was giving his audiences such high doses of nitrous oxide that his shows were becoming unruly, even violent. So he was thrown out of town. He then traveled overland to Lake Erie and on to the Erie Canal, stopping off along the way to perform his show east all the way to Albany, where he arrived in the fall of 1833 and immediately poured his earnings into hiring a few Albany gunsmiths to improve his gun. From Albany, he made his way to Baltimore. Here he hired a gunsmith named John Pearson to further improve his gun. This is one of Pearson's prototypes. While in Baltimore, Colt also made a very important visit to a man who was living in the city at the time, a man who would turn out to be of great use to him. Roswell Colt. Some of you may recognize him. I know you do, Glenn. He's an important figure in the history of Patterson, but at the time he was living in Baltimore. Roswell was a second cousin of Sam and he was by far the wealthiest and most illustrious of all the Colts. He'd married into a rich family in Baltimore, and he was very well connected to other rich and powerful people. 
And Sam realized that if he wanted to make something of his invention, he needed access to more capital than he could ever raise selling hits of nitrous oxide. And Roswell Colt was his ticket to this capital. In May of 1835, Sam visited Roswell at his home in Baltimore at 10 Gay Street and showed him the revolver. Roswell evidently liked what he saw and immediately loaned Sam $300. That may not sound like a lot of money, but it was critical seed money at the time. More importantly, Roswell introduced Sam to prominent men who were willing to invest. Roswell gave Colt access and he gave him credibility. By the late summer of 1835, Colt had a number of prototypes ready and some drawings of a patent application. With these, he sailed to Europe, first to London, then to Paris to secure his patents. He returned to the United States and on February 17th, 1836, he applied for his first US patent. The patent was issued a week later on February 25th. Sam Colt, mind you, was still just 21 years old. That spring, Colt, with the help of Roswell and another cousin named Dudley Selden, formed a corporation, the Patent Arms Manufacturing Company, and opened his gun mill in Patterson, New Jersey. The gun mill is the building to the right with the pointed cupola. Why did he make his industrial debut in Patterson? Well, for starters, Patterson had excellent water power for manufacturing, of course. But more important was the fact that the town was largely controlled by members of the Colt family. Roswell again. As some of you probably know, Roswell was the son of Peter Colt, the man who'd been brought in by Alexander Hamilton to run Patterson in the late 18th century and to fulfill Hamilton's vision of a sort of industrial utopia along the banks of the Passaic. In the end, Peter Colt was unable to save Patterson, but he encouraged his sons, Roswell in particular, to invest in the corporation that controlled Patterson and its raceways, the Society for Establishing Useful Manufacturers, or SUM, the sum. The fortunes of the SUM had lunged and lurched along with the American economy, but over time, mill activity increased, and by 1836, Patterson was a thriving city of nearly 10,000 citizens with no fewer than 17 cotton mills, a clock factory, an iron factory, a flax factory, and assorted other industries. And the Colt family was by far the largest shareholder. Between siblings and cousins, members of the Colt family controlled more than two thirds of the stock in the SUM. I have never found any details of the deal that Sam Colt had with the SUM, but my guess is that it was mutually advantageous to all Colt's concerned. Sam was set up in a prime location near the river and the SUM got a prime tenant. And in May of 1836, construction commenced on the gun mill. It was to be four stories high, about 135 feet long and 45 feet wide and built of locally quarried brownstone. The important part of the gun mill for Colt though was not what it was made of on the outside, but the machines he intended to put on the inside. He had great ambitions to manufacture his guns using machines to lathe and mill the steel components of his gun. His goal was to mass produce the guns from machine made uniform interchangeable parts, which could then be put together in a sort of assembly line. Until this time, most products were still handmade and anything made by hand, even if it was similar to another product was going to be unique. It's parts not interchangeable. The key to mass production Colt knew was machines, which could replicate an object almost exactly again and again and again. 
Colt was not the first person to aspire to this. In fact, the gun makers in the Connecticut River Valley, where he grew up, had been trying to achieve something like this for many years. But the so-called American system, as this kind of manufacturing would be called, was still a ways off. For the moment, it remained more of a dream than a reality. Certainly it did for Colt. It was a good dream while it lasted though. Here's Colt at 21 or so, and he looks pretty satisfied, right? And with good reason, he's the darling of rich and prominent men who've invested large sums of money in the gun mill. His name is in newspapers and renowned figures like Daniel Webster stopped by in Patterson to tour the gun mill and marvel at Colt's invention. And he is for a time a very wealthy young man. As part of the deal uh, for his company, he received an advance of $6,000 which was an enormous sum of money at a time when a skilled tradesman, a gunsmith, for example, might make $500 a year. It was a dangerous amount of money to hand to a 21 year old with a burgeoning taste for the finer things in life. Colt was riding high and living large in these days. He boarded sometimes at a rooming house in Patterson, but he preferred to spend his nights in New York City and conveniently a train line had recently opened on the west side of the Hudson, just across the river from Manhattan, leaving Jersey City four times daily and chugging west over the Bergen Hills. So Colt could get back and forth pretty easily. Also conveniently, a grand new hotel in New York, the Astor House had just opened on Broadway. And this was where Colt chose to reside whenever possible while developing his taste for champagne and cigars. His father became alarmed that Colt was spending too much time playing and not enough time working. And that fall, Christopher wrote a letter to Sam. When I consider the common consequences to you and all concern in the success of this undertaking, I cannot but advise that you should lay aside every amusement and devote all your time and close attention to get forward the firearm, wrote Christopher to Sam. When once well underway, your arms in the market and profits realize, then will be time to take a little recreation. Now, speaking here as the father of young men in their 20s, I can say with some authority that Sam Colt would not be the first or last son who ignored a father's good advice, and that is exactly what Sam did. This is a receipt from uh, a tailor named Hatfield and Pearson. You can learn a lot about a guy from the bills he pays or doesn't pay, which is often the case uh, with Colt. There are a number of like this in the Colt archives, many of them, many of them from Hatfield and Pearson. Uh, and if you just sort of scan through this, you can see what he's buying. He's got a white satin vest for $7 a super olive coat for $35. $35 was nearly a month's wages for a skilled tradesman, like a gunsmith working six days a week. Uh, another bill has him down for $62 for a super fine coat. That's about six weeks wages. Uh, and the thing about Colt, as Hatfield and Pearson would soon discover, is that he never paid his bills on time. Hatfield and Pearson would hound him for months, even years, to get paid uh, the, what he, they were owed. The Astor House would eventually have to sue him to collect on what he owed them. The Patent Arms Manufacturing Company failed. It failed quickly and it failed miserably. The first problem was delays in building the gun mill. Almost immediately, the production schedule fell behind because there was no factory in which to produce the guns. Colt blamed the builders, but others blamed Colt for spending more time enjoying himself in New York than overseeing construction in Patterson. It was also the case that adapting machines to make the guns was turning out to be far more difficult than Colt or anyone else had anticipated. Colt's dream of machine-made interchangeable parts was never realized at Patterson. Another problem was the design of the gun itself. The Patterson revolver was easy to break and prone to misfire. The cylinder held only five bullets, only later would a Colt revolver become a six shooter. 
and it had a hidden trigger that only dropped down when the gun was cocked. Now this made the gun look sleek, but it also made it hard to aim and fire. Even worse, loading these guns was a chore that required essentially dismantling and reassembling them every five shots. Hard enough to do in calm conditions with steady fingers, nearly impossible in the heat and dust of battle. The final problem that the company faced was another economic calamity that hit the country in 1837, the Panic of 1837. Colt's guns were expensive, and suddenly no one had any money to buy them. In the spring of 1840, Colt tallied the number of guns produced in Patterson since the mill went into production. It came to 4,012. Of these, 1,312 were long guns, and 2,700 were pistols. That would be a lot of guns for a single gunsmith, but for a factory in four years, it was pretty paltry. Within a few years of opening the Patterson factory, the Patterson Arms Manufacturing Company was bankrupt and Colt was broke and in debt to numerous creditors. His only fixed address during these years was a tiny room he rented in New York City in the New York University building on the east side of Washington Square. Colt's room was in the near tower on the top floor. As his gun company fell apart in the summer of 1841, Colt tried desperately to come up with new schemes to earn himself some money. He called this little tower room his invention and improvement office. One of the ideas he hatched there was the submarine battery. It was based on that idea that he first tried as a boy in Ware in 1829 when he tried to blow up a raft on the mill pond. The plan of the submarine battery was to use electrically triggered explosives, mines, to create a naval defense system. As Colt conceived of it, a network of underwater mines could be remotely detonated by sending jolts of electricity to them through waterproof cables. He hoped to sell the invention to the US Navy. Uh, Colt demonstrated the invention very successfully a number of times in New York, in New York Harbor, and in Washington, DC. The explosion pictured here uh, is on the Potomac River near Washington, where Colt blew up a ship called the Styx. Colt's demonstrations delighted audiences and newspaper reporters, but in the end, Congress decided that the submarine battery was more interesting as pyrotechnics than as a practical defense system and refused to fund the project. So Colt was back to square one. And then this happened. In September of 1841, Sam's older brother, John C. Colt, killed a man in New York City with an ax. This is an extraordinary story and I have no time to tell it now. I'm afraid you'll have to read the book if you wanna know more. Uh, but the long and short of it is that John Colt was soon arrested, tried, convicted, and sentenced to hang all under the glare of intense national press coverage that made the Colt name infamous around the country. It was just one bad thing after another for Colt. But then quite suddenly, and quite dramatically, his luck turned. His rescue came from Texas, and much like the hero in one of those Hollywood Westerns in which Colt's six shooters would later play such an important role, it arrived on a galloping horse. The heroes in this case were the Texas Rangers. For years, the Rangers had been battling Comanche warriors. The Comanche were superior horsemen and fierce warriors, and encounters with them had generally gone very badly for the rangers. Not only were the rangers often outnumbered, but they were also effectively outweaponized. The rangers had better guns, but even the best guns at the time needed to be reloaded after every shot. At a minimum, as I mentioned earlier, reloading took 30 seconds. Meanwhile, the Comanche galloped toward them, firing arrows at a rate of 20 or 30 per minute, and before the ranger reloaded, he was likely to be dead. All that changed on the afternoon of June 8, 1844, when an armed patrol of 15 Texas Rangers 
traveling through the hill country of South Central Texas, came under attack by 75 Comanche warriors. The Rangers had a surprise in store for the Comanche that day. They'd acquired a cache of Colt revolvers, Colt revolvers that had been manufactured at the gun mill in Patterson. Now, as the Indians attacked, they galloped into a blaze of gunfire such as they had never experienced. This painting from 1855 has obvious noxious overtones of white supremacy, of whites over Native Americans, but it does accurately depict the remarkable riding and fighting skills of the Comanche, as well as the very real edge the revolver gave to the Rangers from the moment it debuted that June day in 1844. Americans now had the perfect weapon for confrontations with Western Native Americans that would start to become inevitable in the 1840s. History having long conspired against Colt now seemed to arrange itself entirely in his favor. What happened was a lot of things, mainly all under the guise of manifest destiny, a term that was coined in 1845. In, 1840, in 1848, uh, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo uh, after the Mexican War gave the United States vast new Western territory, including California. And a few days after that treaty was signed by incredible luck, gold was discovered near Sacramento, California. Suddenly thousands, then tens of thousands of Americans head west to Oregon and California to start life over or simply to get rich. And there's one thing that they all want, a Colt revolver. And Sam Colt starts to get rich, very rich. This image of three California dudes is one of the earliest photographs known of men posing with Colt revolvers, but it soon became a common rite of passage for any young man traveling west to stop off at a photographer's studio to pose with a Colt. I am going to end this evening with this image of Colt's extraordinary factory on the banks of the Connecticut River in Hartford. Um, if you, you the parts of the factory are still there, including the Blue Dome, which you've probably seen if you've ever driven up uh, 91. Um, you can still see it from the highway. But this is where the dream of Colt's youth, using machines to make uniform interchangeable parts, was finally realized. His armory called Coatesville was one of the largest and most advanced factories in the country. Uh, by the time Colt died, in 1862, just after the start of the Civil War, it was spitting out guns by the tens of thousands for the Union Army. The techniques developed at the Colt Armory in Hartford became one of the most important milestones on the road to American manufacturing, a road that would eventually lead through Henry Ford's Model T plant in Highland Park, Michigan, and ultimately to factories all across the world. But as Colt himself understood, that road, at least for him, started in Patterson. He may have failed in Patterson, but he learned how to make a better gun and he learned how to run a better company. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing and uh, would be happy to take uh, any questions that any of you might have. Um, and. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. So everybody who's on tonight realized that Jim's book is 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 just an enormous amount of information, well presented, and he literally focused tonight's talk to emphasize the early cult that found his way to Millen uh, Boudinot Streets in Patterson or Van Houten Street as we know it today. Um, so I've put the um, our. Um, uh, just for our PayPal donation, if anyone, again, feels inclined tonight, it's in the chat room. Uh, we've got our first question tonight. Um, is there anything left of the Patterson factory? And I, I guess I'll answer that one, Jim. Uh, the answer is yes. And uh, the goal going forward is to include that as part of the national park. So for the folks who aren't familiar with it, 
uh, Patterson, uh, the Great Falls area in Patterson was de designated a national park several years ago. And, um, and so slowly but surely, different parts of that park are coming to life, literally. And the coal gun mill is, is part of that um, and will be a part of an area that will be eventually accessible to the public. It's unfortunate that area is, is effectively ruins from many mill structures around the gun mill, but the gun mill itself, the base of it is still there. The, effectively the walls of the first story and a half are there. And uh, it, it's an important building and everyone realizes that. So yes, the, the, um, the, the mill will in fact be part of, of um, the much larger national park once again, the monies come in and we can rehabilitate those areas. So that, that will be um, wonderful. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And um, so anybody again, who's got questions, uh, you can put them in the Q and A, we'll, we'll ask those. Um, I got one here from an anonymous. Uh, I came across Colt being referred to as a copperhead, which I thought was a Southern sympathizer uh, in the North. Is this true? And if so, can you expand upon this? And I think, Jim, this is an interesting question, right? About, about Sam's politics and, and his role, yeah. perhaps the Civil War. So take it away. Oh, it's true. You know, I, I mentioned that Colt was on a slave ship. And I'm, the reason I'm so curious about this, this has to do with his politics later on. Um, he was a, a, a copperhead. He was a... Uh, uh, a Northern, he was a Democrat. Um, he had, he wasn't pro-slavery, but boy, did he hate abolitionists. Um, he hated Lincoln. He hated uh, Republicans, Black Republicans, they called them. Um, he would send out anti-abolitionist literature. Um, at his uh, plant in Hartford, he uh, evidently fired he was accused anyway of firing Republicans at his pro-Lincoln workers. Um, and most importantly, he continued to sell guns to the South, to the Confederate, the future Confederacy, right up, if not beyond, um, Fort Sumter. Um, it, he was called in some Northern newspapers, was starting to be called a traitor, um, you know, by, by, getting into uh, April 61, 1861. Um, and there are, you know, there are deliveries that he's making to the South right up uh, until war is declared. But what I will say about Colt is this. He, um, the moment uh, war was declared, right after Fort Sumter, he started running his factory in Hartford almost 24 hours a day. And Colt by this point uh, had become quite a sick man. Um, he died, by the way, only at the age of 47. He'd become quite a sick man, but he worked uh, out of his bed um, 12, 14, 15 hours a day um, to produce these guns. So he really got on board with the Union when he had to, and his guns became quite important to the Union Army. Um, but before that, uh, I write about this quite a bit. It's, a, it's an interesting subject. Um, he was not a... Not a uh, a pro-abolitionist or pro-Lincoln guy. Thank you. I just, a couple notes uh, from Bob and Tamara, <coughs> Tamara. They both thank you, Jim, for your presentation. Um, mm -hmm. I've got a couple more questions. I'm gonna throw one more at you that some folks uh, might find interesting. So mm -hmm. Sam had, as you point mm -hmm. out, siblings really from um, his father's two marriages. And one of his siblings was Christopher Jr., Christopher Cole. And what's yeah. interesting about that is Chris Colt also had his challenges in life, uh, trying to make money for his family and what have you. And it's Christopher Colt that moves into the top floor of the gun mill to literally try out the first silk uh, weaving operations in Patterson, mm -hmm. effectively at the same time the gun mill is operating. So in the same period of time, late 30s, um, you know, and he's there. And Christopher uh, is in Patterson because, again, I guess he also saw the opportunities probably that Roswell invited him down, perhaps. I mean, who knows? Mm -hmm. But uh, but but his his siblings also, I mean, we heard about John, the, the man who murdered his publisher, and we heard about other siblings. But this is one that relates actually to, to Patterson. And unfortunately, Chris was only there for three months. And that three months, he pretty much shut, shut down the operation. But it was Mr. Murray and a, a family famous person from Patterson, John Ryle, who come in a few years later to buy Christopher Colt's equipment and literally 
make Patterson the Silk City. So the Colts actually played that role as well. They did. Yeah. So, sure, um, go ahead. I say it was sort of typical for Christopher Colt. He had a very spotty career. He would try many ventures. They all would fail. Um, and he eventually died rather tragically in Hartford. Um, it's not clear exactly what he died of, but it seems to have been from alcoholism um, and became a great embarrassment to Sam. Um, so yes, another brother sort of bit the dust. Uh, um, even though Sam, you know, Sam died at 47, but he outlived both John and Christopher. The only one who outlived Sam was a brother named James, who lived in St. Louis, who had his own notoriety. He was involved in a, in a duel in St. Louis, um, and he was quite a figure. Um, so there was, there was a lot going on in the Colt family. There was, there was. Um, so I think I answered the question. We have a question. What's the status of the rehab plan? So that'll be part of the National Park Service. Uh, was the Patterson plant sold in, in 1843? It actually was. It was it, ironically, there's a, again, this is all in Jim's book, but John Ehlers plays a big role with the, the post gun mill era with the guns because Ehlers ends up buying up all the supplies and all the guns and effectively makes new Patterson Colts his way, basically. So there's the Ehlers version of the Patterson mm -hmm. Colt. Right. Um, and yes, the plant was eventually destroyed it, it, the the Patterson gun mill sort of time took its toll, right? So um, it had a few fires over the years. Um, it effectively went from, as Jim pointed out, four really a four and a half story building down to two stories by the time the 20th century arrives. And unfortunately, the 1980s is what really did the last blow to that building. So, uh, but again, it's there. The original stone of the very first, the tower stone is there that cupola tower that we saw i mean that's still there so i said it'll be a nice it'll be a nice really focal point for the park um is it true that original here's a question uh is it true that original gun bluing material utilized whale oil which makes reproducing it faithfully almost impossible do you know anything about blue the bluing they use for for um i, I really don't know anything about bluing i i um I, i'm sorry i'm not the guy to answer that question yeah so um so okay okay um, so any more questions from folks, um, for Jim, uh, like I said, I'm, Glenn, I'm there's one, yeah, there's one in the oh, Q and yeah. a about the Morris canal for shipping. Um, I, it's possible, but here's the deal with the Morris canal. Uh, the Morris canal was to some extent a competitor with the railroad that Jim described earlier, the trip from Jersey city to Patterson, it was a competitor and the Colts actually were in fact uh, competitors there as well. So they weren't a big fan of the uh, of the Mars Canal for one big reason, it stole water as far as they were concerned uh, because the gun, the gun mill and all the other mills couldn't operate without water. And when you start putting all that water into that Mars Canal, there's a problem. There's a, a bigger story about that for another day. Mm -hmm. But I would imagine that the quicker way to get guns into New York City, particularly, because that's where where Sam had his sort of a lot of his sales were taking place there. He ran ads in the newspapers and things. Yeah. I mean, it, well, they weren't sold at the factory. I'm sure a few people probably bought a few right there in Patterson, yeah. but most of them ended up in New York, at least initially. And from there, then they were distributed uh, down to New Orleans and other Baltimore and other places and things. So I, I would imagine it was the railroad today because I think the Morris Canal would have taken too long and they wanted to get them sold as much as they could. And of course, another interesting subject for for another day is is Jim's reference to uh, what happened with Sam going to Florida to supply guns to the, yes, to the army yes. that was fighting the Seminole Indians. And to this day, if any one of you wants to try it out i've tried to estimate myself where in saint augustine or maybe a, a couple of cases of guns that have been down there for well over 175 years <laughs> his guns roswell's again i, I i'm just giving you a tease here because you got to read his book okay he's got all the detail about roswell trying to help uh sam with his guns that get to some extent a bunch of them get lost in florida so it's all in the book and it, again this is a it's just a wonderful um modern biography of Sam that there's so much new information in there and, and really interpretation of what it means uh, over the years. So, um, okay. So yeah, I think we answered that one about the plan to rehab the cult site. Yes. Yeah, so that's, that's going to happen. It's right at the corner of Millen 
and um, and Van Houten. It was called Budno Street there. Budno was one of the original SUM investors. And that's where, where Roswell bought most of his SUM stock was from the Budnos. So the Budnos, in a sense, have a role here mm-hmm. with Sam's with Sam's factory. So um, is the plan online? No, I don't believe there's anything online yet. There's some there's some publicity uh, in the newspapers about the site. It is a brownfield. That site was used as a dye uh, operation, uh, meaning silk dyeing operation. So Patterson, the Passaic water apparently, uh, and again, not an expert, but apparently is the Passaic water is such good quality that that the dyers loved Passaic. And actually the dye houses lasted right up into the 1980s. And that area was a standard silk dyeing company. So the gun mill was part of that well into the 20th century and it's loaded with hazardous materials. So yeah. that's part of the problem here of, of rehabbing the site is that we got to clean all that up first. So um, his, and oh, Tamara says your, your research is very intriguing. I can tell you from experience talking to Jim that um, he, he went far and wide as most book authors do to find tidbits. And again, he, he's the one who found that Corvo set of narratives that from the missionaries that told us a, a much different story than we knew for 150 years, probably. So yes, and he's a, Jim is an excellent uh, detective of finding connections and things. So, so we got another thank you for Mr. Rice and uh, he, oh, someone, Tamara, Tamara one of the historic buildings. Okay, go ahead. Go Tamara ahead, also wanted to know where she can buy the book. She can buy it on Amazon online, or she can Amazon. go to Barnes and Noble. They have it. It's okay. actually, Jim, is it now in soft cover now? It's in soft cover. Yes. All right. So mm-hmm. um, here's both. Here's a hard cover and here's a soft cover. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've got both. So uh, yes, you can get them there. Um, I saw it in the Paramus Barnes and Noble uh, recently. So call ahead um, just to make sure they have it, but it's, it's well available. And again, it's, it's Scribner, which is part of Simon and Schuster, one of the biggest maybe the biggest publisher in the country. So Jim has got a long history with them and, um, and we know why, because he writes excellent books. So, um, so anyway, uh, I think, I think we're there. So, um, so Jim, I want to thank you uh, for, for coming on tonight. This is long anticipated. I'm so happy you did it. And I guess you customized it for our, our audience here tonight. So thank you for that. Uh, I want to thank all the attendees for coming tonight because you're all I have excellent questions, and I'm sure you, you as well as I and, and Dave actually certainly enjoyed the program. And I want to thank Dave, the man behind the logo there, who's sharing screens and doing all sorts of stuff. So, in any case, this this will be this was recorded. It will be posted on YouTube uh, probably in a couple of weeks. So, if you have any friends who um, you know want to see this and weren't able to come tonight, you can share this link with them, and uh, and that's it. And so. Um, so with that, with that note, um, again, Jim, Jim, who's broadcasting from New York City tonight, uh, we want to thank you again for your thank you incredible- very much, Glenn, and thanks to all of you for uh, for for tuning in tonight, um, and um, can't wait to come back out and see see the visit to the museum. Very good. Great seeing you. All right, folks, take care, everyone, and good evening. <laughs>